Welcome to It's Your Date with Destiny with Apostle Vivian and Pastor Gemma Duncan of Divine Destiny Worship Center in Diego Martin. For the next 30 minutes, join us as we take you on a journey of maximizing your potential and realizing your goals through Jesus Christ. Why is it when you need a miracle, it doesn't happen, but when you least expect it, it happens? You are married. You have challenges in your relationship, but your spouse is unwilling to accede to any counseling. Is divorce an option? I'm no How does a parent handle a promiscuous child? What are considered the do's and, and do's of a born-again couple who is not yet married? There are always more questions than answers. That so here is Apostle Gemma. Grace and peace to you. Welcome to us, Pastor Gemma. Thank you for taking the time to be with me today. I really appreciate it. And uh, if you are first time viewer, I am Gemma Duncan. I'm married to Apostle Vivian Duncan. Together we pastor Divine Destiny Worship Center in Digo Martin. Their branches in Sangre Grande in Chaguanas, Faisabad. Tobago, Antigua, and there's a branch in Rio Claro. Join us in all our branches except Rio Claro for in-house service on Sunday at 9 a.m. So we are going to be there at 9 a.m. And we're looking forward to seeing you in person. And our weekly services, Thursdays and Fridays, would remain online at 7 p.m. nightly. The administrative office is opened from Monday to Thursday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. and the business center on Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Remember, if there's a public holiday in Trinidad and Tobago, the offices and the business center will remain closed. We started a little series called Rules of Engagement in Marriage. And uh, let me see if I could bring you up to scratch, those of you who haven't been with me all along. We agreed that marriage have become a conflict zone since the time of Eden, where they started the blame game. And uh, we agreed also that we need rules of engagement to help us to resolve such conflicts. Many of us have not been counseled. And so we went into marriage without set rules of engagement, I think. When we talk about rules of engagement, and we're going to come to that sometime later, maybe not today, where we decide when there is a conflict, when there is an unresolved issue, this is how we will treat with it. Now, we may not always succeed, but in our heads, we have a sense of where we're going, a sense of what the end game should be like. We discovered also that our formative years greatly affect how we deal with conflict. And so we decided to set some goals to help us along. Why goals? Well, the only way you can measure success is by goals. I must set goals. If I know I want to achieve something, when I set a goal, the specific goal will let me know, all right, uh, you achieved it or you fell a little short of it or you went beyond it, which would be great. What are some of the goals? To provide success in managing conflict, to get rid of bitterness, unforgiveness that often plague relationships. And that's one of the big ones, bitterness unforgiveness they are the two biggies in terms of how well we will resolve conflicts in our relationships and in any kind of relationship much so marriage we have to forgive and keep forgiving and i keep saying that um, billy graham was interviewed and one of the questions that he was asked was uh, what was the secret of the longevity and uh, the loving relationship that he and his wife enjoyed and he said something that struck me that I decided to make a part of my own philosophy of life. And he said, I forgive and keep forgiving. And that's one of the things that we have to remember. So we have to get rid of the bitterness. We have to get rid of unforgiveness. Why goals? Why do we set goals? Those goals teach us to aim for a win-win situation. Win-win means we both win. It's we, not I, must win. If Vivian and I have a conflict and I win, 
the truth is we both lost. If he wins, we both lost. And our aim, the goal is that we both must benefit from this. We both must win. So it has to be a win-win situation. We've learned that no one person will ever get 100% out of any relationship. And the T.D. Jakes, and I quote him, says, the best we could get is 80-20. So in any given relationship, uh, if you get 80%, then you're doing pretty good in that relationship. So the importance of these goals is that we aim for peace and happiness and not just winning. And here it says, better to be happy than to be right. What's the point of being right and I'm unhappy? In our efforts to resolve our conflicts, we must celebrate in small ways if necessary. Every time we successfully negotiated a situation, a cause for celebration. Do a little something small and say, you know what? Uh, we, we've done really good before time this would have escalated into something terrible now we are handling it much better perhaps we could go for a ride go for a drive if you're not on a diet go for ice cream or something small it doesn't have to be anything big and spectacular but celebrate uh, cook a little special meal do something a little extra just to celebrate that one achievement in terms of how you resolve conflict why are we having these rules of engagement is to keep hope alive that solutions can be found now we cannot enter into the relationship thinking that you know we can't work this out this is not uh working going to work because some people immediately think when there is some unresolved issues it's not going to work and i heard a discussion on tv some time ago where there was a panel and one of the ladies was asked, well, how do you treat with a situation where you started a relationship, you get married and it doesn't work? She said, well, uh, you get rid of it and try again. In other words, as far as they were concerned, and it seemed as though there was consensus among them, if it didn't work, just change your partner as often as is necessary. But we are saying there will be conflict then try to resolve the conflict. It's not about changing the partner because what I've experienced in my own life and, and dealing with people and them talking to me, changing the partner didn't solve the problem. Because if you don't change, you get another partner, you are the same person, then the conflicts are gonna rise again and you're gonna try to resolve them in the very same manner. If you failed before, it's gonna fail again. And it's not the person, it's the method and how you treat with it and what you did that created the failure. Well, of course I am saying you because you're listening to me, but it takes two, the tango, right? One hand can't clap as it will be persist. Rules of engagement in a marriage are important to create what we call a safety zone instead of a conflict zone. It ensures that regardless of how heated an argument becomes, no mean words will be spoken or objects will be thrown. In other words, we already agreed that no matter how angry I get, I don't speak mean words. And we're gonna talk much more about that because my intent is not to hurt my intent is to find resolution i'm not trying to hurt you because you may say something that hurt me deeply and my reaction is to say something to hurt you back we are both going to lose in such a case and this makes for trust when we have to deal with unpleasant situations when there are rules of engagement that we both agree to whenever something difficult comes up we go into the discussion with a sense of trust there's no foreboding you're not afraid to deal and treat with situations because you are afraid you're anticipating that you're going to have a negative reaction and it's going to escalate into something that you don't want since uh there's a pattern like that in your relationship and you know the last time we spoke the last couple times we spoke or the last few times we spoke we attempted to, to communicate it became something very unpleasant and, but if we have rules of engagement and if we choose to abide by them, of course, you're human, so you're going to break it, you know, ever so often. You apologize, you move on, you try again. What is the fact in all of this? We're talking about how we resolve in conflict. The fact is we will disagree. We're two different persons and we are not going to see things in the same way. We are not clones of each other. And we have a way, I think ladies tend to do it more, forgive me. Uh, if I'm wrong, but we tend to feel that um, 
we could clone the person. He's different to me. He thinks differently. He sees things in a different way. But give me a chance with him. In time, I will get him to come across to my side to start to think the way I do. This is not going to happen. That very rarely does it happen. Ask anybody who has a long-term relationship, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, and they will tell you um, they didn't succeed in changing that individual or cloning the person. You're going to frustrate yourself. So the fact is we will disagree. What is the truth? The truth is we must deal with these issues or disagreements that may arise. And we have to now come to terms with the fact that some of them must be left alone. There are some things that you have to just leave it. In other words, the old people said, we must pick off fights. There are some things are not worth fighting over. Some things are not worth being bitter. They're too little, they're too petty, they're small. And it took me a while, but I've learned that. Like a, a one single glass left in the sink and you would think, well, the sink is clean, everything is clean. Why would he not wash this one glass? That one, leave it alone, leave the glass. If you want to wash the glass, if you don't want to wash the glass, leave the glass and things like that. Just leave it. Of course, each of us will have our own pet peeves about things that we don't like about the other person. And if it's something that's not life threatening and so on, as upsetting as it may be to you, you need to leave it alone. There are some things that you have to leave alone. There are some things, if we go into formulate rules of engagement, that we must tolerate. It really bothers you. It really upsets you. And you're going to have to go to God and ask him to help me to tolerate this. And uh, what I found in my own experience is that um, you could actually tolerate a whole lot of things. And after a while, you get accustomed to it. Things that you didn't particularly like at first. No, you didn't fall in love with it, but it doesn't bother you that much again. And there are things that you're going to have to tolerate. How long would you have to tolerate it? Well, as long as that person continues to behave in that manner. Because one of the things, again, that I learned over the years is that if an individual doesn't think that what he or she does is wrong, it's hardly likely that you will get them to change. And there are many things that will upset you that is not wrong in themselves. Let me give you an example of such a thing. For example, I'm married to a pastor. And uh, of course, as a pastor, sometimes people think that you're supposed to be available to them 24 seven. And so time is something that will always be an area of disagreement or conflict. How much time is spent dealing with other people. And even when you're home, the fact that uh, they still invade the little time that you have together, you know, by the telephone that they call at all kinds of times. And some people, they just sit down to have a meal and they call. And even when I'm listening to him saying, we just sat down to eat, could you call me a little later? That person insists on saying what they have to say anyhow. And five minutes pass and it's going on. The meal is getting cold. I'm annoyed. And so that's an area of conflict. However, is it going to change? Um, it could change if the, my husband decides that, um, you know, these are the, the areas that I want to preserve. So when we have a meal and somebody calls and you tell them, call me in the next couple of hours, that that person will honor that. And if that the individual insists on going on with the conversation, he will have to say, I'm sorry, I'm going to hang up. So he could resolve that, right? Um, and even when there is some level of resolution in terms of how we treat with time, sometimes it's really annoying. I mean, we've been married for all these years and there are times when, you know, I tell myself, wow, this is extreme. And uh, I mean, some people go so fast, to want to come to the house. You want to come to the house, come on. Uh, here is that person uh, spending so much time in church, you, that individual is available to you, the pastor. You could call him anytime, and yet the times that he do uh, spend at home, you want to drop by the house. Some people do that all the time. Now, some pastors don't seem to mind. I've gone to pastors' homes, and the male uh, seem happy to have people coming in and coming, dropping in and, you know, staying on and for a long time. Usually the female is the person who has a problem. And so there are some things that we may have to tolerate. But there are some things based on how it makes you feel. You feel that um, 
to you, it can't be left alone. It's a bugbear. It's bothering you. It's making you bitter. It's making you unforgiving. And uh, you have to deal with them because they will fester like an untreated wound that eventually will become incurable. Some of these same things could become that. Some things that you left alone, depending on who you are. Some people are clean freaks. And then they marry somebody who's leaving something here and dropping a towel here and dropping something on the floor and leaving the bathroom in a mess and leaving the sink in a mess. You just clean the sink and that person would leave grains and rice grains and all kinds of things and you're a neat freak. That is something that um, you have to know uh, bring balance to that relationship. So what did we see? If we're talking about resolving conflicts, if we're talking about rules of engagement, there must be some things that are left alone. There must be something that we must tolerate, but there must be some things that must be dealt with. And if we find that we are unable to deal with these things, to resolve them, then we have to look for help. And I am appealing to you, you're listening to me, we need to seek help. Too often in the church, and perhaps that's the culture that all of us are responsible for, um, we don't want people to know our business, and that's fine, because um, we don't expect you to be ventilating your business in public. And so things are happening, and uh, we say nothing. Of course, the first thing you need to do is try to resolve it on your own, both of you. That's the first step. The first step shouldn't be counseling. You should try to resolve it. But when you find that over a period of time, uh, you've tried and you cannot resolve it yourself, then it's time to seek help. Remember what I said previously, for those of you who've been listening or following me, that I would suggest that every young couple find in their circle of, of acquaintances, friends, whatever you want to call them, some more seasoned people, people who've been married for a while, older folk, who you could talk to. You don't have to confide everything to them. But if you started that relationship with them, then over a period of time, you can always bounce off things by them. Now, start serving these older people. Visit the homes and see what can you do for them. And some uh, people, if it's a, 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 the husband in the, of the couple, you could help do a little yard cleaning for them and so on. If it's your wife, why not carry a meal or help clean the home or something? Whatever help that that older couple need, they may need somebody to drive them if somebody's ill or something like that. Start serving that individual, start offering service. And what I've found in that kind of a setting, you find that meaningful relationships will come. It doesn't always work, but it could come. That's a couple then after over a period of time that you can now go and sit down and talk to and say, so and so is happening. Sometimes what I've found is people didn't say anything. I've seen couples spending time with older married couples and they pick up stuff, they observe certain things and they would, depending on who it is, will want to broach the subject and say, I observe so and so and so, may I, you know, is it, is it okay if I talk to you both? And I would suggest that you say yes, because many of us hold on to what we consider privacy, you know, a private person and so on. And then what happens is normally when we try to hide certain things, when it's unresolved, it becomes volcanic, it erupts, and more people get to know than you intended them to know. And so I'm saying seek help. I was talking to another pastor and we had the sad news of a couple's son who just came back from studying abroad didn't even quite settle in and a simple issue he wanted the car keys father's car keys to go somewhere and the father refused the next thing he, he stormed off went up to his room when the mother checked because she found that he was there for quite a while and uh, you're not hearing anything he, he hanged himself and obviously i don't know what went in but the fact that the daddy didn't give him the car to go wherever he was going could not have been the, the real problem. They, they had to have been an issue, something underlying. And that uh, fact that the father wouldn't allow him to take the car uh, is what tripped, caused him to trip, was a trigger. Because he went over and said they don't care about him, nobody can care about him and so on. Oh, well, uh, for four years they, they, they spent foreign exchange to educate you 
<laughs> and um, they had to pay for your apartment and your upkeep. And I'm thinking, uh, if parents will make that level of sacrifice for a child, then there is some bit of a care in there. Because some parents are not going to do it. They will say, you know what, we're not putting ourselves in debt and out of the way to do that. And he had just come back from being from qualifying. And how is his mother ever going to recover? God alone knows and God alone can help her from that. And here we are. Now, that's not a married situation, but it's unresolved conflict. He, I don't know what happened to Brown. I don't know what, what, what was, you know, what went on. I, I really don't know. However, that it will reach something like that, that means that that person was experiencing something and did not speak. And I'm saying too often in marriages, we don't talk about what's happening to us. And when one party seems happy, it doesn't mean that both people are happy. I used to think, you know, that, you know, well, if he's happy and the person, the, she should be happy, not really. One person could be happy, blissfully unaware that their partner is experiencing something very negative. As we close, and we're going to pick up here next time, I think, because we're going to eventually look at 10 things that we'll want to keep as our actual rules of engagement that each of us will make a pledge towards that this is what will happen when we have a disagreement. What if before we have a discussion on something, a very difficult topic, we pray first? That never dawned on me to do that. Because usually whenever we deal with certain disagreements, I'm usually so angry that prayer is the last thing on my mind. I'm upset. And as you people say, I kind of set like Mappy P. I can't wait for him to come home, to pounce on him. If you're young, you probably wouldn't know. And if you're not from the country, you would know what it means to be set like Mappy P. Mappy P is a snake that coils itself up and just has his head up. And as soon as you come close enough, it will just dart at you. But what if before we have conflict we both pray because sometimes uh, i would pray and say lord give, give me the right words help me to say the right things help me to express myself in a way that he wouldn't be upset and we could resolve this but then he does not respond in the right way because if i said i want to talk about someone so i don't know what you're talking about or something like that no that that just triggers me off and of course i forget all the prayer that i prayed and oh yeah ask holy spirit to temper you and all of that but if both of you pray first before you sit down to treat with something and say, ask Holy Spirit to help both of you to communicate effectively so that your feelings would uh, be clear. What you want to say would be clear to the other person. Ask Holy Spirit uh, help you not to use words that are going to hurt or wound that individual. Ask Holy Spirit to uh, bring a resolution to this particular area in your lives. Both of you on the same page. And even when uh, you're done um, and it didn't quite turn out how you would have wanted it to turn out, you, you pray together again. So you pray after and say, Lord, forgive us for not uh, really sticking to how we thought we should communicate. Uh, forgive us for hurtful, using hurtful words. Our intent was never to hurt each other. And Father, going forward, help us to improve on our communication. If we do that, I, I would think that um, perhaps we will be on the right track. So the four things that we would um, pick up when we meet next time, four keywords would be to negotiate, to barter, to compromise, and to sacrifice. Uh, these are some skills that um, if you go to a counselor, they're going to help you clarify that. And sometimes, um, as I said, these are certain skills that perhaps you and all can't uh, perfect on your own. And so the counselor will help you. And when you're talking terms like negotiate, barter, compromise, sacrifice, this will be most likely from a, a, a trained counselor, somebody who has some level of qualification in psychology and so on, uh, in counseling. And the persons will probably use these terms and explain them to you perhaps much better than I would be able to. I really hope that I helped you in some way or the other 
in helping us to resolve our conflict and understanding why it is very important to go into our relationships with rules of engagement. And even if we have not done so yet, it is not too late for us to do it. And remember, for this to work, it has to take two of us. you to remember what Jesus said. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. God bless you real good. Join me again next time for Rules of Engagement in Marriage. <laughs>